The universe is unimaginably huge. Our world is just one of eight that orbit around our home star. Our star is just one of the hundreds of billions that make up our home galaxy. And our galaxy is just one of the at least two trillion galaxies that make up the observable universe. There are more stars in our universe than there are grains of sand here on Earth, each one with their own set of planets orbiting around them, just like we have here at home. There could be hundreds of quintillions, that is, 18 zeros, by the way, of Earth-like planets in our universe, worlds that exist in the habitable zone of their star, worlds that have liquid water and air and plants, and even other forms of life. Now, it seems like one of the great ironies of the point in time that we find ourselves in is that unlike all of the generations that came before us, we are extremely aware of the absolutely gigantic size of the universe we live in. I mean, we have telescopes in space right now that can essentially look back billions of years into the past and study the atmosphere of planets hundreds of light years away. And sometimes the sheer scale of it can be a bit depressing because it is in our nature to explore and the distances that we need to cross make it seem almost impossible. Almost. Because there was a time, not too long ago, maybe only a few hundred generations, where our planet seemed unimaginably large too. Thousands of years ago, people lived their entire lives in a radius of no more than 20 to 50 kilometers. But as our species and technology evolved, we did what humans do best and we pushed forward. We crossed massive oceans, climbed over mountain ranges that seemed impassable, and ventured into deserts and poles where no one was meant to survive. But we did it anyway. Today, the world has never been smaller. You can get anywhere in the world in under a day, you can communicate across it instantly, and we can see it all from satellites that we put into space. But just because we did it once, does that mean that it's ever gonna be possible for us to conquer the next great frontier and get humanity to other stars. When discussing space travel, the first thing that we really need to wrap our brains around is the actual distances we need to cover in space. Because it is easy to imagine our solar system like this. These are the pictures and models you've probably been seeing your entire life, but they are incredibly inaccurate. And if you were trying to make an accurate scale of our solar system down to the size of a piece of paper, the planets themselves would be microscopic and your model would look something like this. Now, if we scale up a little bit bigger and make the sun about the same size as a golf ball, the Earth would be smaller than a grain of sand and floating about 15 feet away. And I need you to hold that comparison for later. An astronomical unit is 149.6 million kilometers, and it's also the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. We use this term of measurement to make it easier to describe and compare distances within our solar system without having to use extremely large numbers. Earth is one astronomical unit away from the Sun, Mars is one 1.52, Jupiter is 5.2, and Neptune is 30. But astronomical units become too small when we start to look at distances between stars, which is where light years come in. A light year is the distance at which light, the fastest thing in our entire universe, traveling at about 300,000 kilometers per second, can get in the span of one year. That is about 9.5 trillion kilometers for reference. Now, the record for the farthest and deepest that a human being being has ever been in space goes to the Apollo 13 crew on April 15th, 1970. Their Saturn V rocket launched from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida on April 11th, beginning their three-day, 76-hour journey to the moon. But little did they know, they would never actually make it there, because 55 hours and 54 minutes into their journey, mission control in Houston would ask them to stir the cryogenic tanks. Massive tanks of liquid oxygen kept at negative 170 degrees Celsius, powering their spacecraft. Seconds after they flipped the switch, they reported hearing a large bang, shaking the entire ship, blaring the alarms, and dropping power, which is exactly what led us to get the iconic... Okay, stand by 13, we're looking at it. All of the men had to evacuate the ship and climb into the lunar module Aquarius, only designed to support two men for two days, now had to support three men for four days. And to safely return back to Earth, they had to use what is called a free return trajectory, meaning they looped around the moon using its gravity before returning home. At their farthest, these men were over 400,000 kilometers away from Earth, the deepest that any human being has ever been
been in space, or about 0.0027 astronomical units. Now, it's hard to talk about exploring the universe while avoiding the elephant in the room, which is aliens, specifically intelligent ones, ones with their own languages and technology and understanding of physics that could be somewhere out there doing exactly what we're doing, or they could be a lot more advanced than us. Either way, whether you believe in them or not, NASA and other space agencies have been incorporating the what if aliens contingencies into their missions. And one very important one is a time capsule that we sent out into space on September 5th, 1977, full of images, maps, music, sounds from our world, animals, diagrams of humans, and a map of where to find us. Our first attempt of trying to communicate the story of our world to extraterrestrials meant to survive for billions of years. Today, Voyager 1 is the farthest man-made object that we have ever sent out into space. It took 35 years for Voyager 1 to cross the boundary of our sun's influence and end up in interstellar space. And today, in 2025, only a year and a half away from Voyager's 50th anniversary, Voyager 1 is traveling traveling through interstellar space at about 61,000 kilometers per hour and is about 169 astronomical units away from Earth, about 25 billion kilometers or 0.0026 light years. To cover any meaningful distance in space, you need to go fast, faster than any technology we currently have. But to give you an idea of what's possible, we need to look at the fastest man-made object ever. In 2018, the Parker Solar Probe took off from Earth on a first of its kind mission to touch the sun. I'm not going to dive too deep into the purpose of this mission, but since 2018, the Parker Solar Probe has been increasing its speed by conducting gravity assists from Venus. Essentially, it orbits around our neighboring planet, using its gravity to get a closer orbit to our sun, and every time it does that, the sun's gravity pulls it harder, reaching a maximum velocity of 692,000 kilometers per hour, 10 times faster than Voyager 1, and still, only about 0.065% the speed of light. Meaning that if we can maintain the fastest speed of the fastest object we have ever created, it would still take us 6,500 years to reach the closest star system to Earth. Now, even if Proxima Centauri wasn't the closest star to Earth, it would still be one of the most intriguing, and you can guarantee that if we are ever able to make it out of our own solar system, this will be the first place that we go. Proxima Centauri is one of three stars in the Centauri system, made up of Alpha Centauri A and B, two stars orbiting each other that are both very similar to our own sun, and Proxima Centauri, which is Latin for nearest, a smaller, cool red dwarf star orbiting much farther out from its two siblings. And if we go back to our scale model, where our sun is the size of a golf ball and Earth is smaller than a grain of sand, do you know how far the Centauri system would be? If we placed our sun in New York City, you could find the closest golf ball sized star in Atlanta. And if we placed it in London, the closest golf ball would be in Milan. In 2016, we confirmed that Proxima Centauri had at least one exoplanet orbiting it. And that exoplanet planet just so happened to orbit in the Goldilocks zone, meaning it is the perfect distance from its star to support liquid water on its surface. The planet has a mass 1.3 times larger than the Earth, a year on the planet lasts 11 days, and its star's lifespan is roughly about 4 trillion years, meaning that evolution has plenty of time to figure it out. But just because a planet could potentially be habitable does not mean that it can sustain life, and other than its orbit and size, we we don't really know much about this world, and any talk about what the surface of it actually looks like is nothing more than theory and speculation. It could be a tidally locked world with scorching temperatures on one side and frozen on the other. Some believe that it could be an ocean world, or at least have a subterranean one. Or maybe it could look a lot more similar to Earth than we could even imagine. We won't know until we get our first flyby. The biggest issue with getting any sort of spacecraft, manned or not, to another star system is propulsion, because the farther and faster we want to go, the more fuel we need, but the more fuel we have, the heavier the rocket is, ultimately slowing us down. It's a bit of a paradox we've got here. And one way that scientists have proposed dealing with this issue is through what is known as solar sailing. These reflective sails that use the momentum of light particles from the sun, or supercharged lasers down on Earth, to move forward in space at insane speeds, potentially maxing out at 20% 
represent the speed of light. Meaning that if we could get proof of concept out there, we could have a solar sail carrying a tiny camera flying by Proxima Centauri B 30 to 40 years after launch. This would be amazing in itself, getting the opportunity in our lifetime to see a real life world that doesn't belong to our sun. The first humans to experience anything like that in a long line of the 100 billion humans that came before us. But we're not here to talk about flybys. We're talking about getting a human to one of these worlds. Is it really possible? Scientists have been trying to answer that very question for the past few decades. And we do have a couple of theoretical modes of transportation that could one day bring humanity to another world. Nuclear propulsion relies on a nuclear reactor in the rocket's engine to generate power for thrust, using the fission reactor to generate electricity, similar to how a nuclear power plant generates energy on Earth. This is going to be a technology that you're definitely going to be hearing about in the next few decades, specifically as it's a part of NASA's Moon to Mars vision. But it's only about two to three times faster than our current chemical rockets, making it an unlikely mode of transportation to other stars, unless that nuclear propulsion was on the back of a generation ship. Generation ships have long been a staple in spacefaring science fiction stories. A theoretical spacecraft designed to carry humans on a journey so long that multiple generations would live and die on board before ever reaching another star. The onboard inhabitants of a generation ship would be well aware that anyone who was there on launch would not survive to see the new world, only their descendants. These ships would have to be massive, with ecosystems for food, air, and water recycling, artificial gravity, education systems, and structure to maintain order over hundreds, if not thousands of years, with no nowhere else to go. And just this year, you might remember my Project Hyperion video, which was a worldwide contest to design a potential generation ship for a 250 year long mission. Another potential solution, if we can't conquer speed, is cryogenic sleep, placing astronauts into suspended animation by freezing or slowing their biological processes for extremely long durations, sleeping through interstellar travel and waking up decades later having barely aged at all. Sidestepping the need for the size of a generation ship or other enormous life support systems, and NASA is heavily researching this one, mimicking torpor in animals, which is similar to hibernation, where the metabolism, body temperature, and energy use drop dramatically. In NASA's concept project, Torpor Inducing Transfer Habitat for Human Stasis to Mars, they determined that astronauts could be placed in Torpor for up to 14 days at a time on repeated cycles, reducing mission mass and volume to Mars by 60%. But the idea of cryogenically freezing someone for decades and then bringing them back is still completely theoretical. Antimatter rockets are exactly what they sound like, using the annihilation that occurs when antimatter and matter collide to generate energy for thrust. Now, the good news with antimatter is the amount of energy this produces could theoretically send a rocket flying at 99.994% the speed of light, but the downside is that producing antimatter is astronomically expensive and isn't efficient in the slightest, and the only way that we've been able to create it today is by using high energy particle accelerators, like the one at CERN, and we are not producing anywhere near what this kind of mission would require. And if anything goes wrong, it would be catastrophic. Now, all of those potential solutions are limited by the speed of light, the ultimate cosmic speed limit of our universe. But what if we could bypass that altogether and move faster than light without breaking the speed limit. General relativity tells us that the fabric of space-time is dynamic and it can bend in multiple different ways, and we already know this. The gravity of black holes is so strong that it bends time and space so much that the two basically reverse. And the next thing that you need to understand is that the expansion of space happens faster than the speed of light. So what if we could bend space just enough to create a bubble around our spaceship that we could then propel faster than the speed of light? This is what's known as warp drive, and it's not about moving a ship through space really fast. It's about propelling the fabric of space-time itself. Our ship remains motionless, surfing on a bubble of space-time 
which is moving faster than the speed of light. And while it does seem like something straight out of a science fiction movie, again, it is theoretically possible. We just need someone, or something, to figure out how to make it work. The wormholes also work by manipulating the fabric of space-time. If you think of space-time as being like a sheet of paper, you can mark two locations as point A and point B. If you curve and bend that paper enough, you can bring those two points extremely close to one another, and then all you have to do is pop a hole through it. This seems to be like every movie's favorite way of handling interstellar travel. The characters just jump through the space tunnel and get where they need to go, but wormholes might actually exist, and they've been a part of Einstein's theory of relativity since 1935. Now, we have yet to make one, or find one, and if we did find one, it would probably crush anyone or anything we tried to send through it, but they still might be out there. So when we look at the options presented in front of us, it doesn't look like we're gonna have the chance to be exploring the cosmos in this lifetime, which is why you probably heard the saying, born too late to explore the world and born too early to explore the stars. And there's a good chance that that saying is right, even though it's not too late to explore the world, you can still do that whenever. <laughs> but while these things seem so far out of reach that while they may be theoretically possible, they may as well still be science fiction, I wanna remind you of a news article from the New York Times in 1903, where they predicted that it would take humanity somewhere between 1 million and 10 million years to successfully build a plane. And only nine weeks later, the first man-made flight ever took place. And 122 years after they published that article, there are over 100,000 commercial flights taking place all over the world every single day. So while some of these ideas might seem impossible right now, so did a human flying machine in 1903. 